the event that transformed my family going forward from my childhood was the death of my dad. Uh, he was apparently one of these budding superstars where he was a colonel at 26, having graduated from West Point, didn't make it out of World War II. And that, what that did to my grandmother, his mother, uh, was really uh, unfortunate because it, it, it required her to be a real force in the family that almost nobody could withstand. It was like a, a big sandstorm that you just quit. So, for example, I had to <clears throat> eat supper at my grandparents' house my whole childhood until my mother sent me away to uh, prep school which I thought was a bad idea at the time. But I think she thought that that might expose me to a better class of people than those that I ran around with at Bird. Uh, and, that's, and that's probably true. I went to uh, Woodbury Forest and d d hated it. It was a dead poet society all over again. So after a couple of years of that, my uh, mother had remarried into the Jacobs family. So he thought, my, my dad, Walter Jacobs Jr., uh, thought it would be a good idea to send me to a military school. So he sent me to Culver, which is the premier, uh, it's a prep school in uniforms. And uh, I, I joined the Black Horse Troop, as they called it. Uh, Culver was, had so much money, they had an indoor polo arena. And it was, it was amazing. I loved it. It was my security choice, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I don't know how I got in. I don't have any idea that I, that I should have gotten in, but for some reason I made it in, and so I was delighted. I think I might have been accepted at, at WNL, and I just chose Tulane. I just wanted to stay. So I got to uh, Tulane, which was, um, it introduced me to a culture and to a city that I had, n I mean, the difference between North Louisiana and South Louisiana and then New Orleans is night and day. And I was uh, overwhelmed with, with the cosmopolitan live and let live sort of mentality. When I, when I graduated in 1968, that was the beginning uh, of the end of my world politically and socially as, as, as I knew it because now we're dealing with the era of, of the assassinations of Dr. King and, and, and Bobby Kennedy, the riots at the Democratic Convention, and I began to, my eyes began to be open to, to, the, uh, to the problems created by a male, a white male culture, um, and that simply were no room for half the population, either women or people of color. And I began to see uh, something that after 1968, a lot of the friends that I have that graduated, say, in 75, 74, they went to law school to make a difference, to change the world. In my day, it was like I went to law school because it was sort of required. I was going to be some kind of professional. I, I didn't want to go to Vietnam particularly. I thought it was a bad deal, but I wasn't very articulate about why it was a bad deal. And then um, when I got out, I remember one of the earliest things that I, I was involved with was a fellow, gosh, I'm going to forget his name, but he, a, a young black kid who had been in the line to be inducted, he had gotten a letter, dear so-and-so, and was in the draft line in Baton Rouge and was passing out anti-war literature while he was there in the line to be inducted, and they threw him out of the line and then arrested him for evading the draft. And he was given a, a number of years in federal prison for evading the draft, which was so wrong. And it's one of those things that, that you know, as a child you wanted to run, tell mom to go, wait, 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 this, this, this isn't right. And I began to realize the power of, of a federal court um, to level um, the majority rule notion, which is how you define democracy, and how that becomes a dictatorship if there's no check and balance on the other side, the other leg of our republic. 
uh, being, being liberty, there are some freedoms that are too precious to leave to the whim of the majority. And so that began to change everything. And I thought, well, what am I going to do? And then I got an offer to join my grandfather's law firm, Blanchard Walker. At the time, Blanchard Walker, O'Quinn and Roberts was uh, one of the two major firms, maybe three, in, in Shreveport. And so I, I went there, and I could not have been, with my changing values, could not have been more of a fish out of water. When I was at, at Blanchard Walker for about a little less than two years, I can't remember. Uh, and so I just closed my eyes, you know, and jumped off the roof and took a chance. And I remember my first month in private practice, solo practice. I thought, this is really a bad idea. <laughs> my secretary makes more than I do. <laughs> but little by little, uh, uh, my practice began to expand. I had uh, sort of tried to take on everything. And the, my first cousin uh, and, and a fellow that was ended up being the head of Arkla Gas, Jim Wilhite, had formed a Sound City music recording studio, and I was the lawyer. But, and that kept me afloat for a while. I was, I was helped in my career by the, the moves that the Caddo Parish uh, or the city of Shreveport would make uh, that were totally race-based notions. And that helped me along. I met um, one of the great lawyers of Louisiana, a fellow named George Strickler, who now is, teaches at Tulane Law School. George came up as part of the ACLU uh, to fight some of the ordinances that Shreveport had passed. One of them basically said it's illegal to, uh, for long-haired people to go into public places. What? <laughs> and uh, they were serious, and I said, well, you forgot about women? Yeah, we did. We didn't mean that. Okay, well, let's redo it. That's all right. And they did, and finally they came up, and I remember the mayor, nice guy. Nobody suggested he needed to be a genius. But he got on TV, and he said, well, these lawyers have boxed us in by making a judge, persuading the judge to, to throw out our statutes. And these activist judges have just got to stop. And now we have a new ordinance, which makes it illegal to throw projectiles in, in parks. And he added, and I swear he said this, I'll never forget it. He said, and the reason for this is because everybody knows that hippies strew LSD tablets around for small children to eat. And the reporters there were going, good Lord. And they looked at him, and one Ken Booth, I think was his name, from <coughs> Kia Radio, he said, Mayor, what about footballs and baseball? Well, that confused him, and they hooked him off the stage. But that was the kind of stuff in those days. It wasn't hard to win cases because it was so blatant. My practice uh, at this point had sort of branched into two directions, one, three, actually. One was, um, had to do with the police department and their malfunctions. Um, and the other had to do with prison litigation. And the third was uh, criminal defense. Because my practice in that regard was unusual. Most of my criminal defendants had been so blatantly abused by race-based treatment by the police I ended up suing the police department because uh, the highest ranking black officer uh, on the force, there were only four black cops, and the highest ranking was a major, which is a big rank in police departments. And his total job was um, black school patrol. That was it. And so when we filed the suit, uh, they had this is 1975, 76. I mean, Jimmy Carter was president. This was supposed to be a new era. 
they had they they were horrified when we got the judge to rule that they had to hire women who applied. We did the same with the fire department, except the fire department had no applications by blacks because they wouldn't take the application form. So that was unusual. We had to form what we called, what the judge called a ghost class of people who had applied and been turned down. Well, how are we going to find those folks? So he allowed us to put an ad uh, in, on, on the black radio stations. If you ever applied to the Shreveport Fire Department, contact this number, which was a new phone number that didn't identify our firm or anybody with it. The sheriff was a nightmare. Uh, he was <clears throat> from, that, from the 1920s his whole life and just was so blatant about it, you were just, you were just shocked. But I remember seeing this black kid that wasn't even part of our class. Oh, he was part of the class, but he wasn't a named plaintiff. And he had a cast on his forearm, and it was leaking some kind of orange, yellow kind of pus looking stuff. And I said, what happened to you? Well, I got in a fight. And you got arrested? Yes. And let me guess, the other fella didn't get arrested. No, sir, he didn't. And he's white, right? Yes. All right, so what happened to your arm? Would you get that in the fight? Yes, sir, I broke my arm in the fight. Okay, what did they do? They took me to LSU and they put a cast on and said, bring him back in two, I think in 30 days. Did they do that? No, sir. How long has it been since you saw a doctor? Six months. And I was, I, I was for some reason, that, that drove me into a, um, and this has been a problem for my whole career the anger you feel, the rage you feel at somebody that's treated like this as though this is not America. This is certainly not the America that you learned about in civics class, um, which by the way, they don't teach very much anymore. So they took this, uh, I started yelling and screaming and told the sheriff to get him over to the little hospital, little cottage hospital there in Arcadia. And I remember being in the room when they took the saw and, and sliced off the cast and there was a <clears throat> nest of roaches growing in his flesh. And you thought, gee, this isn't Russia, this isn't Cuba, for God's sake, what's going on here? So I called the judge and I said, Your Honor, I don't even want to have a court hearing on this. I want to go into chambers right now, if I can. He said, come on. And so, the sheriff came in uh, with his lawyer, and I, I relayed the, the, what had happened to this fella uh, to Judge Stagg, who had this habit, you knew you were in trouble if he looked over his glasses at you, and he was looking hard at the sheriff. And so when I finished explaining about the roaches, the sheriff said out loud and to the judge, he said, what's wrong with that? And his lawyer leapt to him to say, Your Honor, he didn't mean that. The judge said, I think that's precisely what he meant, and my remedy will be commensurate. And he just hammered them. The, the police, was, everything they did was race-based. That was, had been the era of the infamous George D'Artois, who was a major enemy of ours. And frankly, who scared me to death. He was a, as far as I was concerned, an evil person. He actually got indicted for murder, as we recall, but then died before he could be prosecuted. Damn it. I sued him 17 times, I think. Uh, it wasn't hard. What they did was they had separate roll calls for black and white officers. And then when we made them hire women, the men's bathroom had hot tubs and workout rooms, weight rooms. The women had a janitor's closet with a toilet in the back. That was it. And it just kept on and kept on. And so we told, we told the city, I told three separate mayors, your jail is a nightmare and you're going to get your you-know-what suit off and you need to fix this. How about this? My wife and I are good at this jail litigation. We will fix your jail and tell you how to get out from under the threat of a hugely 
expensive lawsuit, and we'll do it for nothing. We won't charge you. We live here. We're taxpayers. And all three mayors in their successive terms said, no thanks. Well, then a woman came along, was arrested for a DWI, totally destroyed by that having happened. She had been on the wagon for some years. Threatened to kill herself. The, the jailer said, well, don't worry, honey. We'll be walking by every 15 minutes. Well, of course, they gave her a 15-minute gap. She hung herself. And guess where they came for, to be the lawyers against the city? Well, that was as lucrative as anything we ever did. So I'd like to be remembered as someone, regardless of when I came to the fray, did my best to make a difference in the community I still live in. Um, with varying degrees of success. I wish that, that I was more spiritual about this kind of thing. My wife is. Uh, I am not particularly. The, the, the thing that bothers me about where my life has gone is I still l live with this rage at, at, at injustice and you can't fix the whole world, and I know that, I don't even want to try, but it, it still makes me angrier. I, I, I wish that I wasn't so angry still about civil justice. Criminal justice, I, I co-founded the, the uh, State Criminal Defense Bar Association and ended up being the president of it. Um, and, and that's that's achieved some success that I'm proud of um, in the legislature. The, um, the only thing that I have not been successful with that I would like to be remembered for, maybe above all the rest, is getting that damned Confederate monument out in front of our court of law and move it to a museum, state exhibit museum, say, anywhere.